There was this guy named uh, Carl Bond, and uh, he his his shtick was, and I call it a shtick. I don't mean that derogatory, but <clears throat> his claim to fame was um, that he could sing and play just like Stan Rogers. And he he and I mean that literally. The, if you close your eyes and listen to Carl Bond sing. You think you're hearing Stan. It's really uh, spooky. And uh, he's a super nice guy. He, and he's, re he's really, really good. Uh, but, you know, people, unfortunately, I'm, he's not the only one, but I've seen hundreds of them. Uh, people that sound like somebody that much never quite get ahead because they're not, they don't sound like themselves. They sound like somebody else. And so originality is what makes success in the business so he should be way famous just because he's so good uh but he's not he's he's a, he works for a living and and but i absolutely love his singing and love him he's such a great guy and when another morning first came out he and i uh looked slightly similar we were both you know, big men. I was blonde, uh, but we both wore, you know, goatees, and I had long hair. Uh, but he had longish hair, you know, down over his collar. And and we were at Stan Rogers Festival. And so <laughs> Carl was doing a show under one of the big tents, and after he was finished playing... He stepped down off the side, and this woman rushed up and, and said, Oh, my God, I love your music so much. I just can't believe I'm seeing you in person. And she was from the States or somewhere. And she started digging around in her, in her, in her bag. He said, You must sign my CD. And she's re reaching around in there, and she pulls out a copy of Another Morning, my record. And Carl... <laughs> Looks at the woman, looks at the record, and thinks, well, I'm not going to burst your bubble. So he opened the CD and signed my name. <laughs> and then he, and then she hugged him and kissed him. Oh, my God, JP. <laughs> and uh, he left the tent and come up to the beer garden where I was sitting and told me this whole story. And my God. We laughed. It was. It, it's. St we still laugh about that to this day. That that we really didn't don't look that much alike. But I guess somebody who you know never saw me, either one of us before, could have made the mistake. I suppose. But yeah. And there's a uh, there's a few times I wish Carl Bond had been me. <laughs> he could have took all this shit instead of me. There'll be some people out there that are, will be surprised to hear this, but, I, but I'm going to elaborate on it. Because it's such a huge part of my career, is I was never a Stan Rogers fan. And the reason is strange. Uh, so the first time I ever heard Stan's music, I was probably, I don't know, maybe eight or, or something like that, maybe. Um I'm not even sure. It might have been older than that. I was old enough. I mean, he died in 83. So, yeah. It, it about I was probably 8 to 10 years old. Somewhere is in there. And he... 
I heard his music because the only reason I heard it was because a, a, a close friend of Joe's uh, sent us a mixtape. He used to do that all the time. He'd send us mixtapes from out in, out in BC or wherever he was and there'd be comedy on it and all this, and he'd, and he'd sort of make a two, an hour long radio show on a cassette and he'd always put really cool music on these tapes. And so he sent on this tape was, was two songs, uh, the Blue Nose and the Genie C. And I, I, and Joe was, was, uh, at first fascinated by Stan. Uh, but then it, he didn't seem to gravitate to him either, but, we listened to that those two songs quite a bit, you know, it would come up. And there was something about the man's music that I don't even know how to put my finger on it. At that time, I didn't understand why somebody who was that brilliant um, was not getting into my hopper, you know. He didn't, when I listened to him, I didn't see him on the same level as Lightfoot or Christofferson or these other writers that I idolize. I don't know why, but it, I, it would come to light later. Um, but I, and then I, as I, when another morning hit, and of course I started to get out around and play festivals and do all these things and run into a lot of other musicians, people that I, I, I took as new idols, you know, there was so many of them that I met that just, I just went, wow, these people are so good. Uh, just unbelievable. And then the stories would come in, right? The story people, one of the magic things about being in this business for a living is that you, you're privy to some stuff, you know, that goes on that you, no one else would ever hear this unless you are in that fraternity. You know, it's, it's a, and I don't mean to exclude the women because they're just as bad. They, you know, you can hear the same stories from, you know, I heard stories from Sylvia Tyson. I heard stories from, uh, oh God, like there's so, so many people like, and it, people don't, the general public, the listen to the audience, you know, they don't understand that the musicians are a family. And so the horrible things that happen to musicians in their lives become legendary and mostly uh, eliciting great deals of sympathy and compassion and because unfortunately, most musicians live a tragic life. It's, it's, there's a great deal of loss in, in, our, in our lives. And because we choose to let it happen, sometimes you can't help it. Like I was discussing this with a friend of mine a few days ago who had just really discovered the history of Roy Orbison and couldn't believe the, the output that that man had even after losing his wife in a in a motorcycle a tragic motorcycle accident and his two children in a fire and having severe heart problems at the you know before he was even 50 and like all these things you know she couldn't believe what he had gone through well you know that story translates across just about every musician there's always some horrible thing in the background of of genius right and these stories get told and shared out on the road. Some of them are shared solely because they're humorous. And there's been some great laughs, and I'm sure some had at my own expense, about the thing that about the things that, that, that musicians say and do on the spur of the moment, or there's the sheer insanity of some people doing things that you just can't believe they get away with, right? And so as I you know, ventured out into the world, started to hear stories about Stan Rogers. And they weren't good. They were actually pretty, pretty bad. Like, I, I, I got right away from a lot of people that he was not a nice man. He was not a nice guy. He was uh, angry. 
and violent and disrespectful and had an ego the size of a fucking blue whale. And he had insulted a lot of people and just hurt people's feelings and, ju and just, he was just, he was not palatable as a man. And, and, and I didn't even know the half of it at that point. But I started to realize that that's what bothered me about his music. There was a part of his, his personality that was coming out in his singing and writing that bothered me. There was some aura or some energy that came from what he was doing that hit me the wrong way. And I had already haven't had enough experience in the business to meet people that I just didn't like because they were assholes. And subsequently, a lot of those people's those people's music fell off my radar, except for a scant few. I still love to hear Hank Snow pick the guitar, but I'm not a big fan of his singing anymore because, I, as I, as you know, in the early in the early uh, days of this series, he was one of the first people that just completely dissed me for no reason whatsoever. And, you know, it's it's funny how, how people, and I'm sure that this has happened to me, that I have said or done things not meaning to that soured somebody's opinion of me as a man and therefore took them out of my fan base. I'm, I know I have. It's, it, but I didn't mean it. Apparently Stan used to mean it. He was, and then as time went on and Garnet, Rogers, his brother, put out his book about their life together on the road. It 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 just became crystal clear to me that 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 was the reason. Talking about a man that was arrested and charged with attempted murder at a gig because he he threw a mic stand at a guy so hard that and he threw it bottom first these big, heavy, cast-iron metal discs that the stand screws down into, he threw it so hard at this guy's head, and the guy just barely moved out of the way that it went through a cinder block wall into the manager's office on the other side of the wall. And the, he was charged. He was charged with attempted murder. And uh, it... It, it it was in the States that this happened. And all I can say is, is he's goddamn lucky he didn't end up in jail because he did eventually get out of jail. The, the guy dropped the charges and whatever. And But, like, this was the kind of shit that was going on on the road with these guys. And there was a fight almost every night. And he, I just got this impression from reading that book that Garnet and Stan, well, Stan, not Garnet. Garnet was just trying to hang on for dear life and, and fell into the bottle, as he describes. And Garnet's a wonderful man. And But Stan just had this horrible entitlement that he kept, he just felt he should be more famous than he was and that he should be getting made more money. And no other kind of music seemed to be valid to him. And he was pissed off about disco, and he was pissed off about, you know, pop radio, and he was, he was just pissed off. And fine, so you're not getting exactly where you want to go in the business, but you don't take it out on the audience. That's the why would you ever do that, right? And it's said to conclude this section about Stan that Stan died right at the precipice. Of, of fame, of real fame. He's only famous amongst writers and, and you know, some people in the folk idiom. He's not really known in outside those circles. And I believe he would have been if he had lived. I think he would have evolved. I think he would have, he was a smart man and a great guitar player. And I think he died right at the point where he was about to break out 
he was about to break out in a big way. And that's sad. And I think at the end of his life as well, he, he was starting to mellow because he was getting famous and he was getting better gigs and he was, you know, doing, starting to, you know, matter on the scene in a bigger way, actually quite a large way at the end of his life. And it's just sad. It's very sad. And it's sad that, that his life apparently was filled with so much angst and so much bitterness. And I really believe that that's why I never gravitated to, towards him or his music. There was something in his performance that I could hear somehow that turned me off. And it does to this day. And, 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 and what happens now is I look at him, you know, as he was and as I've been told that he was. And two things occur. I still have this almost an animosity towards him because of the way he was. And I don't think there was anybody better than him at doing what he did. And I believe singing his songs is almost a sacrilege because there's no way you could ever do justice to his music. There was only one stand. That voice was unheard of in the music world. And he, there's just no way to describe Stan as a musician. So I, I look at Stan's music now and I don't like to listen to it because of those two reasons, because I felt so bad about him for most of my life. And then when I realized, you know, when I started to see his sheer brilliance, I just felt like I could never do that justice and nobody would ever do it justice and that he should be set apart as, you know, as, as, as a, as a genius that there's no way to, don't even bother with that. It's like trying to cover Roy Orbison who I mentioned, ironically already mentioned, you can't cover Roy. You really can't. You can, but you'll never do it any justice unless, I don't know. I've heard, I've heard things that are close, but I think Stan's the same way. He's our, he's our Roy. He's our, uh, our writer and singer that just surpassed the bounds in folk music. And there'll never be another one. And if you ask some people, they're probably glad about it. <laughs> the Rogers family uh, would start to play an integral part in my career in strange ways. Um, so when another morning took off, uh, Hilda and, and Adrian and I began, we were touring a lot. We were going... All over, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Shetland Folk Festival booking me just before uh, all of this happened had lent a, a tremendous amount of credibility, credibility to me to my music and my career here in North America. And it wasn't long before we were getting booked at the major festivals in Canada, like Winnipeg Folk Fest, Calgary. Um, Mariposa, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the, the big one in London, Ontario, my hometown and touring, we were just touring and touring and touring. And one of the, one of the, <laughs> one of the big ones we did was because of Shetland again was, and Max, Max and Joella were traveling all over the world to these conferences uh, in Scotland and Europe and the States, the Folk Alliance and all these different things. And they were, I mean, I was, I, I had a really strong role going. And so they, uh, like for instance, just after the morning came out, uh, Larry LeBlanc, who was a reviewer for Rolling Stone, did a full page article on me, a full page in Billboard magazine. 
and uh like it was huge like i i i was uh, i was i was on fire i was on fire and uh so max had gone overseas and and met with some people over there and next thing you know we're playing at the tuner festival t o n d e r tonder but they call it tuner over there in that in their language and denmark and dane danish language and so we end up going to Tuner and playing this festival, and it's just amazing, amazing. Like I could tell you stories about that that would just blow your mind. How incredible that country is, and the people, and the bands I saw over there, and the musicians I met, and I mean they they're going to show up in this series. But I I say this, I tell you this part this this particular time because. Adrian was exceptionally nervous all the time and he 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 got along well with Hilda they knew each other good and she was pretty easy on him but she and I were always fighting about something and it wasn't I mean it wasn't really fighting because it was just me sitting there getting a new asshole torn for some little thing that nobody could understand why she was so upset and so that that was 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 eating at him and so but and he didn't like to fly he was terrified of planes apparently i didn't know this but he wanted to, he didn't want to let me down and he he would get on these planes with us and just grit his teeth and so it was a particularly long trip over there and back two or three or four planes you know well by the time we got back to halifax after tuner fest he was in such a way that he he said I got he said you got to let me do something. I said okay, what is it? He said you've got to let me go to the bar on before we leave the because we were on our way to a for the another two weeks out or three weeks. We weren't even going home. We were hitting the airport, getting in a van, and gone out to Ontario or somewhere. And, uh, a matter of fact, at that time, I believe we were driving a Honda CRV, one of the very first ones that ever came out. And he was literally packed in the back seat with all the gear and it was falling on him. And I mean, it couldn't have been easy. It was a horrible, but I yeah, say it's horrible, but it's how I came up like that. That was completely normal to me to pack three or four people into a, into a car or a, or a, or an SUV style vehicle or a station wagon and all of the gear, all of the product, all of the luggage, and and if if you don't fit, make your fucking self fit, because you got to get to the gig, and this is the way we got got to do it because we don't have a tour bus and we can't afford to fly everywhere, so this is how we're doing it. And but at the same time, I got a lot of sympathy for Adrian because he he wasn't used to that. Nobody really is in this country that much. I've never met very many people who've actually done it the hard hard way. And, uh, so the, we got to Halifax airport. He's like, you gotta let me go to the bar. And I said, okay, all right. So he's already shit in his pants. He's so nervous. His hands are shaking. He's sweating profusely. I'm, I'm worried about him. I'm like, this guy's gonna have a heart attack or something, right? Doesn't he get down to customs? And I swear to God, I witnessed this. They of the three of us, we all had similar things. We had instruments, we had luggage, I had CDs, I, we had all this stuff. Who's the guy that Canada Customs and Immigration single out for, for secondary inspection? Mr. O'Coin. And I swear to Christ, I, I saw him take him away to this room with this this glass door that was frosted. And when the officer opened the door, I swear to God, there was a guy standing in there at a table looking at Adrian, pulling on a rubber glove and snapping it. I swear to God. And I thought, holy shit, he's going to die in there. Like, And so we, we went through no problem. They never even asked the question out into the main part of the airport and all of it, about 15 minutes later here comes Adrian 
and he's as pale as a ghost. And I said, what happened? He said, holy shit. He said, they all, he said, they were talking about strip searching me and they went through all my things and all my, and he was in a bad, bad way. So we took him up to the bar and we let him pound about three or four beers into him and went out, got the vehicle and, and took off on the rest of the trip. But, you know, this is what life was like at that point. It was, it was insanity. And we were taking a lot of gigs, you know, that were, um, I, I almost call them experimental because I believe that we were at the, fir we were at the end of, how's the best way to put this? We're at the end sort of, of the, of the commercial interest in folk musicians here on the East Coast. We're at the very, we're getting at the end of it. And then we're also at the very beginning of this weird new folk boom that seemed to be happening everywhere because Natalie and Ashley had brought folk and traditional music to the forefront through the major labels and the Rankin family and Rita McNeil and, and soon thereafter, Bruce Guthrow got on with EMI and had a couple of major number one hits. And so we were at this, we we're in this magic time where there was a whole bunch of new things popping up and we were saying yes to everything because why not, right? And uh, so we get a call from... Somebody calls Max and Joella, and uh, I believe at the, by this time, I think by this time, Danny McDonald, another close friend of ours, was actually acting. They were, we were getting so busy that we we had to have a dedicated booking agent in their office, and so Danny took took me over, and uh, Max and Joella went straight to just management and finding us new opportunities, and they were doing an incredible job, and so. Anyhow, we get they get a call from this guy named Troy Greencorn. And uh, he says, we're starting a songwriters festival in Canso, Nova Scotia. Now, if anybody knows where Canso is, Canso is literally at the end of the road. It, there is one way in and one way out. And it's, it's the furthest east point in uh, the continental North America. I mean, Newfoundland is further, but Canso sticks out further east than anywhere in, the, in, the, in North America, on the continental, I think. I'm pretty sure that's true. That's true. And it's, a, it's an ancient, ancient fishing town. And there's been all kinds of industry there. Like, they've been there since... Uh, 1604, I think, is when they started. <coughs> and they've gone through all kinds of ups and downs and catastrophes and disasters and and great fortune and uh, you name it, they've gone through it and they've just never given up. They've just stayed there. It's a, an incredibly small population. I think it's under a 1,000. I think, I, I'm not sure. I know at one point they even lost their incorporation. They're no longer a town. They became a village, and that was a big, big deal. A lot of people protested that. And anyhow, so I hear about this, and I'm going, what the hell? How? What? What? what are you kidding me? And then Max tells me, well, they're doing it in honor of Stan Rogers. And I said, Stan Rogers, uh, why, why can't so? And so then I find out that, you know, uh, a lot of the, a lot of the music that he had written was about that area and that he'd been adopted by those people. He wasn't from there. He was born in Hamilton, Ontario, but he had, I guess, aunts and uncles there that, uh, and other distant relatives. And so... He had come there, him and Garnet and others from the family, had, and the band and stuff had come down there over the years, and 
they just fell in love with the place and he wrote about it extensively. So I thought, well, this is kind of interesting. Well, all right, well, let's, let's go see what we can do. Right. And so I, I, I'm telling this story because I think this would be of great interest to everybody and anybody who's ever been to that festival, how this thing started and how incredible it was. So off we go, me and uh, Adrian and uh, Hilda and out to this town. I immediately, because I love the ocean so much, I was blown away by this place. The Just the drive out there was, well, it was a bit frightening because it was a horrible road and it's 80 kilometers from the main road out to Canso. And we passed through all these little villages and towns, and it was just it was just the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. Slow trip. Bad road. They, did, they didn't keep the road up very good. And uh, that would come later when the festival, you know, exploded as a tourism as a tourism thing. So we get there and we I was expecting a festival grounds, you know, a gate and a field and a main whatever. What is it? We get there, and it's the high school in Canso. And the parking lot of the high school is filled, well, not, well, yeah, pretty well filled with uh, pop-up tent trailers. And I'm thinking, oh, they've people are already camping. And we, walk, we get in this place, and, and they start to get us oriented and find out that the... <laughs> The pop-up tent trailers are the accommodations for the artists. Again, I was like, this is cool, because I love that kind of stuff. What I didn't realize was, is that Canso is the coldest fucking place on the face of the earth. People think the poles are cold at night. They get nothing on Canso, and... They they had the festival there because it was the only place they could have it. They could they were trying to secure a proper grounds, but they couldn't get it that year, so they they went ahead with it anyway. And so the main stage was the gymnasium stage in the in the high school, and there were different there were little workshops in the classrooms all weekend. But this this pop-up tent trailer, which I, I, at first glance, I was just like, this is going to be really cool because I just love that sort of thing. But holy crap, we almost froze to death. And this is in July. And uh, at night it was freezing cold. And, and, and I, another thing I didn't had never experienced before, well, I had, but this was a special kind of this behavior at Stanfest, which has continued on to this day. People don't fucking sleep. I don't know what it is about the place. It's There's some kind of magic or spell on it. When you get out there, all you want to do is drink and play music. And so we barely slept because people like Oliver Schroer, who <laughs> I love that man to death. I'm so sad he's gone. Him and a bunch of these other yahoos were with us. We were all yahoos, but they were they were out in the parking lot in between these tent trailers jamming until 5, 6 a.m. in the morning. I don't know how they did it, for one thing, because it was like 2 degrees Celsius. But, I mean, it was it was pandemonium all weekend long. It was one of the most joyous, impromptu events that I had ever seen. I was blown away and I, and and then the other the other things that blew me away were like meeting Oliver Schroer who I had been introduced to by Paul Mills who gave me his album called Jigs Up and is still one of my I think it's one of the best fiddle records that was ever made in the history of fiddle so he was there I loved him I was I followed him around like a puppy and I also met Valdi who, who, again, that man was just incredible. He was, he became one of my lifelong friends and still is to this day. And 
I think Bruce Guthrie was there that year as well. And at the end of the weekend, uh, Troy Greencorn, the guy who put it on, his wife, uh, uh, Jennifer, uh, they came to us and said, listen, uh, you, you guys have been the backbone of this event. Uh, speaking to me and Valdi and Bruce and, and Troy said, I would like you to be uncles to this festival and come and play it every year. You're you're hired as of this moment, you're hired for life. And I thought, wow, like that's, who ever heard of such a thing? Because festivals just don't do that. And uh, so uh, Tuner does it, but you have to go to the festival many years before they make you an uncle, then you can come every year and get paid, do it, right? So it wasn't a ton of money, you know. I, I think it was a thousand dollars they paid us for the first weekend we were ever did it. And uh but I thought, man, yeah, absolutely I'm doing this again. It was just magic. It was the most magic thing I'd ever seen. And uh so the the other the other person I met there, of course, was some some of the Rogers family. I met Ariel, uh, Stan's widow. And she was a very interesting woman. And she took to me for some unknown reason. She just did. And uh, she was very brusque and funny and uh, uh, forthright. And just no bullshit, you know. I really, really liked her. And I still love her to this day. And I met, I believe I met his stepchildren, the girls, and his, uh, David Rogers. And and I'm pretty sure uh, that I that was the year I met Nathan, his, his son, his biological son, with Ariel. And uh, Nathan was, well, we're going to get into Nathan later who I also love dearly. And, uh, uh, but Ariel, without knowing it at that time, was about to, was about to do something that uh, was going to really throw a curve into things. And it was, it, it was a it ended up being a good curve uh but initially it was uh unexpected and she proved an ally in a very difficult time uh with people around that that all of us were associated with for quite some time her for years and me for you know the very beginnings of my career she stepped forward and and did some things that altered the course of, of my life and my career. And I, I don't even know if she realizes it to this day, but she did. And ultimately set me on the path to where I am now. Sitting here in, in a comfortable home with a, with a good woman and a good career. And during a pandemic, it all went by me pretty well without blinking. I just put my head down and kept working. And uh, the, only way, the only reason I could do that was because of the past 40 years that I spent working this thing. And it was, it was people like her that came along and did these little things that gave me that power eventually, right? It takes years. So, yeah. I'm going to leave it there, I think. I think we're far enough into this. We're going to start... To, I think the next episode is going to be very interesting because uh, there's going to be some personnel changes and there's going to be some, you know, further further work at the Stan Festival. And, and yeah, so stay tuned. There's going to be... Uh, things are getting quite interesting right now in this in this story. And, it's, and, and as I go forward with this, it becomes a little more difficult each week because there are so many things happening that I almost have to base each episode at this point upon a single event and discuss the background of all of it. And I will probably be jumping backwards and forwards in time 
in small increments to make it all hopefully make sense. I really appreciate all of you listening to this. This is a, uh, it's cathartic and it's also healthy, I think, to, to talk about all of this stuff and also to, to give credit where credit is due to, to the hundreds of people that helped direct my life and my career over the past four decades. And also to give credit to the hundreds of thousands of people who, maybe millions, I guess, who have stuck with me. They kept me in their, they kept my music and me in their lives for four decades and never deserted me and never questioned me or, or judged me during all that time. So, yeah, it's very interesting. It's been an interesting process. and I hope you love it as much as I do. And I got to, the other hard part about this is trying to figure out what the joke is at the start of every show. <laughs> Thank you.